and welcome to the first of the Working the Bay series. I am Susan Speck Polk and I literally would not be here today if it weren't for our guest speaker, uh, Afi Speck. My dad was born March 25th, 1932. Uh, and he has literally been on the bay his entire 87 years. Um, his parents, um, Marion Ridgeway Speck and Arthur William Speck, had a boat business down on Big Creek, which flows into the Great Bay. Um, Dad, once he became a young man, uh, spent more time on the water on the USS Albany when he enlisted in the United States Navy. Um, growing up, our table was always filled with delicious food, whether it be fish, scallops, clams, mussels, eels. Daddy went out, caught it all, mom prepared it, and feed, fed our family of seven, which um, was just a real, a real delight. So growing up on the bay, um, was not only delicious, but it also um, helped me to grow an appreciation of all of this beautiful nature that is around us. Uh, Dad taught us to boat, to swim, uh, to sail, and just to appreciate everything that's here. Uh, we still go out fishing and clamming and spending time on the bay with him, and He's a much better storyteller than I am, so I think you're going to hear um, some very interesting and fun stories today. And we just want to welcome everybody here and say thanks for coming, and um, we hope you enjoy this time. So help me welcome Dad. Let's see. I was clamming on the west side of where the fish factory is now. And when I got inside, I'm counting up the clams, and one of the clams is irregular. So I throw it up to this guy that's in the boat with me, and I says, uh, open that up and take the pearl out. And uh, I went on counting clams, the next thing I know I heard so my God, that's beautiful. There it is. A wow. clam pearl. Wow. Nice. Clam pearl. Nice. Mounted in a gold ring. The ring is worth more than the pearl, but. <laughs> I want to ask you a question, Arthur. I never knew that you could get pearls out of a clam. <laughs> but is, is it frequent or? Huh? Is it frequent or rare? Uh, fairly rare. Although you've never found a pearl in an oyster, correct? Well, I have found pearls in oysters, but nothing that's perfect. Yeah, they're you all know, ugly. Yeah, they're all. Yeah. Okay. But they are pearls. Right. And, you know. I've never found a pearl. <laughs> I'm always looking. You need to look for that irregular one, I yes. guess. That yes, one that you always look for a misfit. Is a clam that is not normally shaped the way most of them are. And if you find one that is irregular, there's a good chance that there could be a pearl in it. Hoppy, can you tell us the the earliest story that you can remember about being on the bay? Uh, yes. Was out on Great Bay and on the west end of Crab Island, which the fish factory is on, uh, there's a target. And they used to use that target from airplanes from Pomona. They had four airplanes come over one day 
when it was really foggy. The planes come down to try to get under the fog. Well, the fog was probably 50 feet high, and then the first one spotted it, and he pulls up real quick, and all four of the airplanes crash in Great Bay on the north side of where the fish factory is now. And I remember they came up the next day with a no, nobody survived the crash, and they came up with the next day to have a diver go down and pull what they could get that was left of the planes onto a barge. Well, it was during the war, so it was in the 40s. Yeah, it was probably 42, 43, somewhere around there. Yeah. Well, I used to live down at Big Creek. There was a house right over where the bridge is now. And we used to live there in the summertime. When I was 10 years old, I used to take and, uh, tow rowboats out of Big Creek, take them out in Great Bay, drop them off, anchor them out there, and let them fish there, and when I would go out in the bay, I would stay right at the mouth of Big Creek, and I'd make a couple circles, and anybody that wanted to talk to me or go back in, they would put the left side of the oar up facing me, and then I'd go over and see what they had in mind. So you went on to have your own uh, boat livery business. Tell us about Captain Specs. You drive boats. Yes, I had my own boat livery business. And, well, help me out here. <laughs> well, when our youngest was five months old, he's always wanted to have his own business. And he worked for the electric company. And he said, you know, I'm just going to work for this company and I'm just going to die like the rest of them. And he says, I want more out of life. Do you care if we buy this property in Tuckerton Beach and start a boat delivery? Well, we bought the place and we had like four rowboats. We actually, by the time we sold it, we had 28 boats with wow. cabins and motors. He built a lot of them and we had them built. His patients finally couldn't take the customers because <laughs> our boats were the cleanest and every winter he just, you know, fixed them up and everything else. So it he didn't said- didn't leak. <laughs> <laughs> and we really had a good business when we left, but I said to him, well, if you leave here, we've got a son who's going to go to college, you gotta have some money. So we sold the business and then he went to Oyster, what was that, Oyster Creek? They were, build, they were building that, and I never knew people made so much money. <laughs> Coming home with electric company paycheck, I mean, when he worked up there, we could probably build three boats in a week, you know. But finally, I said, well, you know, there's no benefits with this and everything Very else. Very shortly, we are gonna come up on to Mom and Dad now live in town, but they have a property right on Tuckerton Creek, um, where we call it his fish camp. And we're gonna go by and we'll point that out. That's where Dad keeps his boats and where we leave to go out fishing and clamming. This so, is my dock on Tuckerton Creek. This is what we call fish camp. Both of the boats there belong to me. And by the way, he didn't want me to buy it. <laughs> we had sold the place, we were getting ready to sell the place, and I said, well, where are you gonna keep your boats? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I wanna buy this piece of property. And he said, you gotta be kidding. They want too much money. <laughs> I bought it anyway. <laughs> so that was one of our good deals. <laughs> How long ago was that? We've had it for like over 30 years. Wow. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. 
We call it up the creek. <laughs> and you were also a charter fishing captain. Yes, I had my six pack mm -hmm. charter license for 50 some years. And finally, I realized there's no sense in me renewing it. Because of my age, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. So then he decided he wants to buy this great big 40 foot wooden boat. <laughs> 42 foot. 42 foot. <laughs> called the Joy Boy. So then he takes this to Beach Haven Yacht Club and he sails out parties. So he had a lot of things that he had to, on the bucket list that he has accomplished. But he said he never saw such a big bottom when he went to paint that boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's where Sheila got married. Yes, my daughter yeah. Sheila got married. That's right. Yes, to and, Chris Mathis. And I, I made it for Captain Speck uh, on the Joy Boy, and it was they were fun weekends out there blue fishing and weak fishing in the ocean. A lot of you probably have never been in Tuckerton Creek. I, I don't know if you have or not, but. Actually, I remember my mother always saying when she went to Tucker's Island, which they called it Sea Haven back then, uh, this is the same creek that they went out of in a garvey to Tucker's Island. And uh, so it's been here for years and years and years. Of course, it didn't have all these big houses. Yeah. remember the night they were going to start night in Venice in Tuckerton and they had about maybe 15 boats going out that night and I was on one of them with my children with my grandchildren actually for me and um, it was me and my grandchildren it was a big boat and that night there was a squall and the boats were, were tossed all over and this boat we were in was probably what 35 or 40 feet it was a big giant boat and it lost its engine power and it was crashing into docks and i was there with two little children like four and seven years old and i and i you know i'm not wasn't afraid i'm not afraid of the water but it was just a scary thing and all of a sudden we get up near the fish camp and out kept captain speck and i thought oh my god we're saved <laughs> and he literally pushed the boat him backwards him well, I cannot explain to you. He pushed the boat with him, pulled the boat with him going backwards. It was, is that amazing? And he pulled us right into a dock, tied the boat up, and I said, Oh, were you here at the right time, Bobby? It was a scary, scary night. Do you remember that? Yep. <laughs> I remember it. Right? That's right. You guided for, what was their name? Joe Sarah. Cohen. Joe Cohen. Joe Cohen. Joe Cohen. That's yeah. how, did that, how did that start, Arthur? Uh, How'd you make that relationship? What was his Randall name? Randall Kramer. Randall Kramer had made arrangements with this guy to take him out hunting. Well, something happened, so he calls me and I meet him right in the center of Tuckerman. And I guess I hunted him for 25 years after that. Oh, yeah. I remember. Duck hunting. Yeah, duck hunting. And, and Uncle Joe really became part of our family. Oh, yeah. uh, we were really impressed because he was like a big shot from New York. And he would take us to fancy restaurants and just really take good care of us. And dad and uncle joe became very good friends and lifelong friends that you know he was really part of our family yeah. so Cap, let's touch back on big crick so your father owned that business started that business well my grandfather and my father they started uh the boat business there where we used to tow boats out the Great Bay and drop them off. Tow, used to tow them out there. What did you tow them out there with? 
today than what they used to be. No. So you would tow them out there and leave them out in the bay? Right, I'd take them out and I'd even drop the anchor over for them. And then I told them, when you see my boat come out of Big Creek, if you want to see me for any reason, just put up the flat part of the oar. I'll run over and see if you want to come in or if you need bait or Whatever. So all these boats, no motors on these boats. They strictly no just ever rope. Right. And I think we had the first two U-drivets of any place around that we rented. I'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad. <laughs> so these people would go out there fishing and clamming or what? They yeah. crabbing. Yeah. and all that. So they were pretty much at your at your mercy, I guess. If they wanted to get in, I guess they could start rowing in, but we used to rent a boat for uh, a dollar a day. And it said that we had free towing. But if you got a boat with free towing, it was a dollar and a half. That's a boat for all day long. Four people. Yeah, things have certainly changed. Did you live over there or did you live in Tuckerton? We had a place, well, we lived in Tuckerton, but we had a house where we lived down there in the summer pond. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. Do you have electricity? Oh, yeah. Oh, you did? Okay. <clears throat> well, there was a guy down from us. His name was Pat Salski. And he had an electric line built all across the uh, marsh that went into his house. And then they finally put the line in from his house down to where the bridge is now. And an outhouse. <laughs> and, an outhouse. <laughs> and they had a little restaurant there. And a lot of the women did a lot of the cooking with like clam chowder and things like that. It was very small. It had two bedrooms and there were seven children in his family and he was the oldest. So he grew up fast. Yeah. Arthur, how would you compare what you could catch if you went out in one of those rowboats today to what you caught then? Oh, uh, well back then we had croakers. Uh, yeah, the bay was loaded with croakers, and I could take you out and drop you off, and you could fish there for three or four hours and catch a lot of croakers. And that was edible. Oh yeah, yeah, they were delicious. Yeah, we used to get a lot of blowfish come in the boats that we rented out and they would leave them all on the floor and nobody made any, we just shoveled them overboard back in those days. Nobody ate them. So could you imagine yourself not living by the border? Well, no. not at all. <laughs> I was 10 years old when I was towing boats out of Big Creek, taking them out in Great Creek. Look at some of the 10 year olds today. So our family business was actually in the very corner of the cove here. Um, Mom and Dad bought this business from Josephine and Frank Lori, um, but it really wasn't much of a business. It just had a few rowboats and they built it up to be quite an impressive boat livery business. And they had the house right across the street um, built. And so we grew up there, um, had a little sailboat that we could sail, any boats that we wanted to take out. So it was a um, pretty sweet place to, 
right over there where you can see which building is where is Panini Bay? Which one is it? The there? house and right to the left of the house. Which one is it? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the highest building that looks like it has a big porch on the top. It's Panini Bay now, which is a restaurant, but that was Captain Specs you drive to. I want to tell you a story about what happened right over here. There's a ramp there, and a boat ramped out. They were, uh, the boat was a 16 footer. <coughs> And I guess there was probably six or seven people in it. Well, when they were coming in, most all of them got in the front of the boat. Well, then the guy slows it down, the boat goes down, <laughs> the boat flips right on over backwards. And what they didn't realize was all they had to do is stand up and the water would only be this deep. <laughs> but they all panicked. And of course, uh, my son and I, we went out and picked them all up. So. <laughs> that pearl. The pearl. <laughs> when we go clamming, we have a basket like this that's placed in an inner tube with a rope. You tie the rope around your waist so that you don't lose your basket and then you jump overboard. Uh, you should wear something on your feet. Years ago daddy would make treading slippers. Now we really just use like water shoes. You'll go in and you'll Take this scratch rake across the bottom of the mud and you're you waiting to hear like that scritch scratch. And then once you do, hopefully when you either get it with the rake, daddy's better at it than I am to actually get it with the rake. I usually just go right down and pick it up and then you find your clams, put it in your basket. If your basket's full, bring it back to the boat. Daddy always out clams all of us. <laughs> Susan has told us that you are teaching all the grandkids to um, do the stuff that you did uh, and you're passing it on. Um, is there something that it, this is going to stay forever, this recording? Is there something you want to pass on that uh, to the year 2050? <laughs> that they take care of what they have here. Nice, yeah. very nice. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been making oyster stew on Christmas Eve? Uh, yeah, we lived on Mathis Drive. 60 some years. <laughs> okay, so that's an important secret family recipe that we will continue. And what holiday do you make that for? Christmas